Shuru, can you? It's good. Yeah, but can you try to speak? So. I don't recall how about now. Good. Okay. Uh, these are some. Oops, some of my collaborators. Uh, um, particularly. Hello. Particularly want to thank uh, Lena Pulgarin Duque, who was a um, IT specialist here uh, working with um, Scott, right? Um, for years. And she helped out a lot with the, uh, particularly with the Python analysis of the quasar spectra. So, very briefly, um, if you look at uh, the space density of, of field galaxies, maybe one in a hundred thousand or one in a million is uh, a quasar. Um, and maybe one in a one in a hundred or one in a thousand is is a lower luminosity version of a quasar called a Seifert. So um, Seiferts and quasars are just sort of different luminosity uh, categories of active galactic nuclei. And active galactic nuclei are powered by accretion onto a supermassive black hole. So close to the black hole <clears throat> um, is, is the accretion disk, which radiates a continuum from um, X-ray straight through to uh, UV and optical. And um, there can be relativistic jets coming out of uh, the, the, the region very close to the supermassive black hole and intense radiation in general. And uh, that, uh, that material, um, the illuminated accretion disk, uh, also illuminates the, the broad line region of the um, uh, active galaxy and even the narrow line region. The broad line regions, uh, the broad lines show uh, velocity widths of anywhere from 5,000 kilometers per second and up. Uh, and they originate very close to the, the core of the AGN. And the narrow emission line regions um, come from farther out, um, 100 parsecs uh, out to several kiloparsecs. And the widths of the narrow lines are uh, typically around 500 kilometers per second. So this is a, this is a composite spectrum constructed from the spectra of many hundreds of quasars in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, so you can see uh, lines from the optical straight through to Lyman alpha in the ultraviolet. So the spectra of uh, AGN sometimes don't have any uh, significant broad um, emission lines, but you can still tell that it's an active galactic nucleus based on the ratios of the emission lines. This shows just briefly an example of a type one um, AGN, a Seifert one, with, as you see, very, very broad uh, H beta line here. And the narrow O3 lines, um, but in a Seifert two, the broad emission is strongly suppressed. And for um, a long time, that was assumed to be uh, mostly due to obscuration and absorption shrouding the broadline region. Um, but there's uh, some of the work I'm going to be talking about um, puts some of that into doubt, or at least says there's uh, uh, more variety in the reasons. So, so this was kind of the, the classic <clears throat> picture that anybody in quasar science has seen hundreds of times, um, where down here you have the uh, accreting supermassive black hole. And uh, close in, there's the broad line region um, rotating or moving rapidly in the gravitational field of the black hole. Farther out, you would have the narrow line region clouds. And if you happen to be looking directly down, um, you would see the broad lines. But if we had a uh, orientation cutting through uh, the the dusty molecular torus, then you might not be able to see the broad lines at all. So that was the unified model of AGN. But things get a little tricky because AGN vary a lot. In fact, AGN variability is great because it's, it's a wonderful way to, to select AGN. 
especially quasars, which you know are quasi stellar. That's where the name comes from. Um, if you want to select quasars separately from stars, a great way to do it is with their variability. And virtually every quasar uh, varies um, by oops by twenty or thirty percent. Um, the, the variability is generally stochastic, as you can see in these light curves. It's pretty random. You certainly don't see periodicity very often. And if you do, uh, and you can prove it, you'll get a uh, nature paper. Um, generally, the continuum is bluer when brighter in quasars. And that um, intense continuum is what drives also emission line changes. And people have used um, what uh, the response of the broadline region to the continuum variability to do what they call reverberation mapping. Here's an example where you see the variability over time in uh, the continuum flux for this um, CFERT1. And you see that the broad H beta flux varies in response to it with a lag. And you can use that lag along with the, the width of the broadline to derive actual black hole masses using the virial theorem. And it's, it's proven to be very successful. But some quasars, some active galactic nuclei change pretty radically. Um, here's, here's an example um, of a changing look quasar as they're called. Uh, here's, here's a pretty typical quasar spectrum with broad H alpha and broad H beta. But in a later epoch of spectroscopy, of spectroscopy the broad lines have essentially disappeared, all of them, leaving only narrow line emission. Here's some more examples of changing look quasars from a paper by John Run a few years ago. Um, and you can see again, the quasar, the blue quasar continuum essentially disappears along with the broad lines. And what you see is basically the spectrum of the host galaxy without, um, without the AGN signatures anymore. So the question is, how does this happen? Um, there's, first of all, large luminosity changes like this should take thousands of years based on, um, you know, basic accretion disk theory. Um, how is it they could happen so strongly in just a few years? Could it, could it be absorption, like a big cloud that's getting in the way of the broad emission line region? and the continuum? Well, in most cases, probably not. It happens too quickly. There's, uh, and some of the spectroscopic changes usually just don't match that kind of uh, expected um, change. Yeah. So there's only one transition to the line, line state, or does it switch back? Yeah, no, uh, some of these uh, AGN are known to switch back and forth between bright and dim states, yeah. Um, in some cases, you, you might explain a brightening, let's say by a supernova or by a tidal disruption event, but generally the, the quasar emission is much brighter than what you would expect from a, a supernova. And it lasts, the changes can last for years or decades, um, far too long for either a supernova or a tidal disruption event. So most likely we think uh, in most cases, it's, it's a change in accretion rate, but again, it happens much faster than you would expect from accretion theory. Um, one, one other cool thing to mention about um, changing the quasars is that given that the quasar continuum can almost disappear and leave just the spectrum of the galaxy, you can look at uh, the M sigma relation just in a single object, essentially, because you can measure the velocity dispersion in the host galaxy. So um, we undertook a large spectroscopic survey as part of Sloan 4. We called it the TDSS and we have a logo and we have like coffee mugs and everything. And uh, it was basically dedicated spectroscopy of variable sources, variable point sources. Um, we, we had no color selection and we just used a generic chi-squared selection against a constant model. So generic variability no color selection. And so we got stars and quasars. Uh, and this is um, this shows uh, a plot just in color color space of 54,000 
quasars that we got spectra for and 25,000 stars, all of them variable. And uh, the quasars are marked in blue. And you see that uh, variability will select quasars uh, even when they overlap strongly with the color space of the stars. So um, about 13,000 of the objects in our, in our sample of 54,000 were actually repeat spectroscopy on purpose. We wanted to look at spectroscopic variability. We then restricted the sample to redshift less than 0.9 so that we would be able to look at H beta and O3 in particular. Uh, a small army of undergraduates at the University of Washington then did visual inspection on all those uh, spectra. They picked out anything that looked unusual and we compared them to any previous spectra that were available. Uh, so there were a minimum of, of two spectra per quasar. And out, out of that sample, we picked 61 changing look quasar candidates. And then we tried to decide, well, what's a real criterion for calling something a changing look quasar? And we came up with a criterion of, of of change of at least three sigma in the broad H beta emission. And so in order to actually measure the a three sigma change, um, and you know, to, we had to do a full modeling of the quasar spectra we using pi QSO fit. Um, so we remove galactic extinction, we model the um, quasar and the host galaxy using eigenspectra, we subtract the host galaxy uh, emission when necessary. And then we fit the quasar continuum with a power law, the usual suite of bomber continuum, uh, UV and optical iron emission, and uh, Gaussian profiles to fit the broad emission lines. Uh, and so this is just an example of one of our CLQs. You see, again, uh, kind of ratty spectra, but you easily can see the radical change between epochs. And it's reflected in the um, photometry that we have compiled from various surveys like PTF, Sloan, and ZTF. And then the, the model fit to the spectrum, the, the data are shown sort of in gray there. And you can see the continuum model here and the broad emission lines fit here, the narrow emission lines as well. And then this is the dim state where it really looks more like a galaxy. We still see some broad uh, H beta emission there, but it's decreased considerably. And when we remove the full continuum model, we can directly compare the, the uh, H beta region. You notice the narrow emission lines basically don't change, but we see a strong change in this case, 4.9 sigma in, um, in the broad uh, H beta line. So that, that, means it's definitely a CLQ according to our criteria. So we, we wanted to look at the continuum versus H beta line changes, and that's shown here. Uh, there's, there's a very strong correlation between the magnitude of the change in luminosity on the y-axis and the change in the broad emission line luminosity on the x-axis. And that's not that's not just due to luminosity luminosity stretching in the plane, right? It's it's you can also see it in the flux flux plane. Um, so we can also try to calculate uh, the the black hole masses using the virial method in both the bright and the dim states, and they turn out to be essentially consistent um, within the errors. So we have we have the the bright state. In, in, with a little red dot in the blue state, uh, the dim state with a little blue dot marked there, and, th and they don't change very much, at least compared to the uncertainties in the virial method of calculating the black hole mass. And what that reflects is that when the luminosity goes down, the full width half max of the line increases. The line gets weaker and it's and it and it's broader. And that's probably just because the, the line emission is coming from a region closer to the black hole. As the luminosity is lower, only the inner parts of the broad line region are being illuminated. Two, two methods, the same? Or, uh, yeah, we're using, the, we're using the same method in both states. Yeah. The same method uses 
Right. Yeah, no, we haven't we haven't done the stellar velocity dispersion analysis yet. Yeah, that would be a good project. So since we get uh, black hole mass measurements and uh, we we can measure the luminosity of these objects, we wanted to see if they if changing look quasars were sort of a different species than normal quasars. So um, we we looked at a histogram of the Eddington ratio of these objects. Um, in the dashed line shows sort of a, a control sample of just normal quasars with redshift less than 0.9 as well. And, um, and the Eddington ratios are pretty broad and go all the way up near one. Um, if you look at extremely variable quasars, uh, just from variable from their photometry, the Eddington ratios are a bit lower, shown in green. The bright state CLQs are even lower. And then of course the dim state uh, of the of the CLQs are much lower. So overall, the the point is that changing look quasars seem to have lower Eddington ratios um, than normal quasars. There's also a, a disk wind model for generation of the broadline region uh, that uh, that looks at this slight change in the in the characterization of Eddington ratio here and. According to the, the theory, the, a broadline region can only form when this parameter is greater than about 1.5. And indeed, all of our uh, CLQs basically fall below that. So that, that may be um, a good support for the disk wind model. Rather than just work with this three sigma criterion for uh, changing the quasars, I don't I have no idea how many minutes I have, especially with the, five. the owl thing. Okay. Um, we, we wanted to get away from just this three sigma criterion, uh, which really depends on the quality of the spectra. It was the best we could do, but we thought we would look for an intrinsic definition of uh, uh, changing look quasar for future statistical studies. And this seems to work pretty well uh, if we look for a, a fractional change of at least 30% in both the uh, continuum emission and the broad H beta. So that's what we'll be using. Um, SAO and Harvard are both members now of the Sloan 5 collaboration, right? Which uh, is running from 2021 through 2027. And it's the first uh, all sky spectroscopic survey. Um, there's uh, hundreds of fibers per field of view that uh, are being used to map across the sky spectroscopically both at Apache Point, New Mexico, and uh, Las Campanas in Chile. And one of the main projects is a uh, follow-up of Erosita X-ray sources. And uh, the other main project uh, in this black hole mapper um, study, uh, part of Sloan 5, is repeat quasar spectroscopy. So it's a dedicated time domain spectroscopy survey. Um, and there are different tiers. It, it, there's uh, a, a, across about 3,000 um, square degrees, encompassing about 20,000 quasars. We will get uh, two or three epochs of spectroscopy spread out um, from with with a cadence from decades to about a year. And then there's a medium tier where over 300 square degrees we'll get repeat spectroscopy for. Uh, about um, 2,000 quasars with 10 epochs. And then finally, there's the reverberation mapping or deep part of the repeat quasar spectroscopy um, effort where uh, over just about 30 square degrees of sky, um, that, will, uh, that will look at, at very high cadence um, spectroscopic observations for about 1,000 quasars. So there's a lot we can learn from spectroscopic variability of quasars. And we will be working on this um, spectros spectral variability project. Uh, myself and Chen Yang uh, are, are getting started on this. And we are going to look uh, across all 
objects uh, with spectra in Sloan that are classified as either a quasar or a galaxy, as long as it has a broad line in at least one epoch. So we're hoping to find many more objects that transition from galaxy to quasar or vice versa in both directions, because we know it has to go in both directions. Otherwise, if all quasars just dimmed, uh, as I've been showing you, um, they would disappear from the sky. So um, that project is underway. Here's an example of, of the fairly sophisticated um, model fitting and galaxy fitting that, that goes into that. Um, I also want to briefly mention um, a project we're doing with Chandra, trying to see whether stellar and supermassive black holes behave similarly. Do they scale according to mass? If you look at X-ray binaries in the hardness intensity diagram, um, otherwise known as, um, you know, X-ray. So this is X-ray hardness, meaning more high energy X-rays on this end and more uh, low energy X-rays on this end. This is X-ray luminosity. Many X-ray black hole binaries are seen to trace out uh, sort of this shape here where, where there's the low hard state. And then as the accretion rate goes up, they go into a softer uh, intermediate state and they can cycle around. Um, and do the question is, do supermassive black holes do a similar thing? Um, everything sort of scales by mass when, when, when you uh, make that analogy between stellar mass black holes and supermassive black holes. So the time scales get much longer, but also, um, also the, the, the radiation that you're looking at gets softer. So you have to compare in the case of X-ray binaries, hard X-rays to soft X-rays, but in the case of the supermassive black holes, um, you have to compare ultraviolet to X-rays. And this is what we're doing. These points here are based on a really great paper by Malgosha Sobolevska, where she um, basically did the extrapolation from X-ray binary variability to AGN variability in the plane of alpha OX versus Eddington ratio. So that's UV to X-ray uh, power law slope basically versus Eddington ratio. And we see that there's some rough indication, although these are all upper limits, that AGN may follow the trends um, shown in the background there. The blue and the red points are extrapolated from uh, X-ray binary and these blue, labeled points are actual AGN. There's some indication that supermassive black hole accretion may be analogous to X-ray binary accretion. And you can also look at the X-ray spectral slope versus Eddington ratio to test the same thing. So that's what we're doing in a, in a Chandra TOO project um, where we're actually taking previously observed uh, changing look quasars uh, in the X-ray archive and we're tracking the, the, the change in their luminosity and following them up with uh, Chandra TOOs. So generally, dimmer does seem to equal harder in the supermassive black holes, just the way that it does with the, the stellar mass X-ray binaries. So there is the summary. Um, changing look quasars uh, show strong rapid variability of continuum and broad emission lines. Um, for lower accretion rate AGN, the variability seems stronger and uh, it's most likely explained by accretion state changes. Um, those changes can actually uh, change the type of an AGN from type one with the broad line to type two with, with little or no broad line emission. So it's not only due to obscuration, it can also be due to accretion rate. And we are testing absorption versus accretion, accretion rate changes uh, with our Chandra TOO program. And we're also going to try to put the changing look quasars in the context of quasar spectral variability overall in Sloan 5. So thanks for your time. Um, so maybe we'll have a
time for one or two questions. Uh, just in the chat, there was a question from uh, Anthony Stark. Uh, what does this variability mean um, for the radio flux of these quasars? Uh, what does the variability mean for the radio flux of the quasars? We actually um, we actually have radio observations um, um, in the dim state for most of these, and we're um, we are analyzing um, those now. Um, but uh, I don't think that there. Yeah, we don't have the the data yet in hand to. To check that, but it's it's a super interesting question because one of the motivations for even believing that stellar mass black holes relate to supermassive black holes is uh, this is one one of the lines of argument. The fundamental plane, which which connects radio um, luminosity, X ray luminosity, and black hole mass over an incredible range of black hole masses. These are the quasars up here. And these are this, the stellar mass X-ray binaries down here. Okay. Um, I see a couple hands raised online, but first one I'll with the audience. We'll go back and forth. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, my, uh, I have uh, uh, some questions about uh, the technical question about uh, how you control the pointing of the fiber. In the multi epoch um, how do you control the pointing of the fiber in the multi epoch yeah. Sloan spectroscopy observations? Yeah. The fibers are um, are are put at the optical centroid of the of the photometric image of the quasar, which is usually a point source. Um, so yeah. I I guess. The, the uh, the fibers were three arc seconds at the beginning of Sloan, and then now they're using two arc second fibers. Okay. What happens if, for example, you have a sheet for uh, one arc second or two arc seconds? If you have a uh, famous effect called the uh, If you change uh, the sleep orientation or move, Slightly, you, uh, sound right. you have to be careful with uh, with placement of the fibers, and I, I assume you're wondering whether some of the changes that we see might be because of shifts in the fiber. And generally, I think we can say no, because we are able to uh, we are able to match the narrow emission line flux in the in the O3 lines, let's say, between the two epochs. And so, so we know we're covering um, the, at least the broad emission line region, which is in the very center. And, and another question about uh, the radio out wave. You know, from your family, it's radio out. Um, we okay, did you expect 10 50%. Yeah, normally you expect about 10% or so of of uh optically selected quasars are radio loud, but um we we just looked at radio quiet quasars only because we were worried about changes caused by the the jets or the synchrotron component of the emission. Good question. Um, okay, maybe we'll take one more question online. I saw your hand up first, uh Miller. Um, so I, I think we can't hear you. It's very quiet. Um, and I don't know. That How about now? Can you hear me now? Much better. Okay. Thank you. One more time. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. Um, so you noted that variability seems to be higher in lower accretion rate systems, right? Um, right. And so I'm curious if this uh, is because at some point, if you have enough in, like radiation coming out of the, uh, um, coming from the quasar, does all the uh, gas that could be ionized is just fully ionized and then there's, not, there, there's no more variability possible or 
you know, like basically is the difference between say 10 to the 30, 10 to the 44 and 10 to the 45 ergs. Like by the point you hit 10 to the 44 ergs per second, have you already fully ionized all the stuff there is to be ionized in the vicinity of the quasar? And that's why there's no more variability? Or do you think there's some other, me or yeah, like physically, why, why would you expect that to be the case? Um, I don't know. That's a great question. Maybe, okay. maybe, maybe somebody in the audience has a theory. Awesome. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. And the other thing was, um, so, okay, going back to the SDSS5 uh, plans, right? So you said that you're going to have 15 minute exposures for, um, you know, several epochs, right? So, okay. So does this mean that, for example, in the deep field, each object is going to have 174 times eight observations? Right, that's right. Okay. So the uh, uh, reverberation mapping, um, ex total exposure is eight times 15 minutes for each epoch. So it's two hours and they'll they'll do that 174 times for, the, for each of those quasars. Gotcha, okay. And uh, is it possible? So is the 15 minute exposure, is that like combined into one image or are you able to, are you potentially able to see variability within a 15 minute snapshot? Uh, no, you can, I mean, you, you can see variability between a 15 minute, ex, between 15 minute exposures, but not within a 15 minute exposure. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, sure. Okay. I know we ran over, but, uh, I think we need to move on to our next speaker just for the sake of time. Yeah. Uh, I know there was a couple more questions online, so I would encourage you to please reach out, uh, directly to follow up this question. Sure. Send me an email with your questions. All right. Um, so we will introduce our speaker. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Leia, if you want to go ahead and share your screen. Sure. Uh, our mm -hmm. next speaker is uh, Dr. Laya Makotuli. So Laya Makotuli is currently an Einstein Fellow at Yale University since September 2021. She graduated with her PhD in physics from Clemson University in May 2021. She is a high energy astrophysicist and her main research focus is studying blazers at high redshift. And, uh, uh, and their connection to supermassive black hole growth, both through single sources uh, studies and the population studies at X-ray and gamma rays. She is also the proud co-founder of the Science Outreach YouTube channel uh, on Planet Nine. So please feel free to check the YouTube channel. And uh, Laya is also uh, my friend and my, uh, we are both in the previous group in, uh, at Clemson. And she's a really nice person. So please uh, feel free to reach out to her if you have any question to, the, to her uh, uh, presentation. So Laya, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Shuri. Um, hi everyone, sorry, my video is going to be off because I don't have a very stable internet connection right now, um, but um, if you have any questions or want to talk to me later, please send me an email if we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to try to be as on time as possible because I know you guys have to leave the room at uh, 1.30, I think, so I'll be um, running maybe through some of the slides a bit fast, but feel free to ask more questions later. Okay, so as Shuri mentioned, uh, my main focus throughout my PhD and now as an Einstein Fellow has been studying blazers and their evolution through cosmic time. And as uh, Paul already introduced, basically we are looking at active galaxies, which have at their center a, a supermassive black hole, which is actively accreting gas from its surrounding. And some of these sources, about 10%, can also produce beautiful jets from their centers, like you see here. We see the image of Centaurus A compared to a normal galaxy such as Andromeda or our Milky Way will look like. And among the plethora of AGNs that we know of, the one that I care for are the so-called blazer sources, which are these supermassive black holes with jets that point very close to our line of sight at a viewing angle of between 5 to 10 degrees. But why should we care so much about these kind of sources? Well, amongst Blazer, it has been understood that the most luminous ones have their high energy peak at 100 and also below 100 MeV. 
You see here in this plot, this is um, uh, several SEDs or spectral energy distribution of various gamma ray detected blazers. Uh, this is just a plot of luminosity versus frequency. And if you group them uh, based on their luminosities, we see that low luminosity sources have their SED peaks peaking at higher frequencies. But as we increase in luminosity, you see that both of these peaks shift towards lower and lower frequency at a point that the most luminous ones have their high energy peak actually in the MEV band. And as you see, they can reach powers of 10 to the 48 or 10 to the 49 Earth per, per second. So extremely bright uh, peaking uh, earlier in uh, the MEV band. And why do we care so much about these sources? Well, they are so powerful that we can detect them up to very high redshifts at a moment in time where the universe was barely one to two billion years old. You see here a, a significance map of one of the highest um, gamma ray detected, uh, highest redshift gamma ray detected sources. This was found at redshift 4.3. Now we have another one of redshift 4.7. So we're going really earlier on in the history of the universe. And not only that, what we've also seen is that if you take a measurement of their uh, mass of these sources, the um, blazers that are found below redshift three is indicated here by these blue histograms have masses that on average are within uh, 10 to the 8.5, 10 to the nine solar masses. But the one that are detected above redshift three, they actually have on average masses that um, are 10 to the 9.5 solar mass black holes. So extremely massive black holes, extremely powerful, extremely earlier on in the history of time. So here the question comes as to how did this black hole grow so big so fast? And another way to think about this question and to answer this question, of course, is also trying to understand how do this source evolve through cosmic time? And for blazers, what we usually talk about are three scenarios, um, which are quite simplistic if you think about them. So one of them is just a pure de uh, density evolution. So through cosmic time, the luminosity of these sources is more or less the same, but uh, their numbers, their density increases or decreases as we go higher and higher in redshift. Or maybe their number density is more or less the same through cosmic time. The only thing that changes is luminosity. So as we go earlier on, they may be more luminous or less luminous. Or maybe the situation is actually a mix of these two scenarios. So if we know their masses and we know their evolution, what we can actually derive is the so-called supermassive black hole space density as function of redshift for both radio loud sources, so the AGNs which have these powerful jets, and uh, radio quiet sources. And this work done in, by Sbarato in 2015 showed that uh, the supermassive black hole space density, so the space density of black holes greater than 10 to the nine solar masses specifically, uh, for radio quiet sources, AGN no jets, did peaks around redshift two at the so-called cosmic noons where most objects that we know in the universe actually peak in evolution. But if we look at the radio loud sources, the AGNs with jets, we see how their peak happens quite earlier on at a redshift around four. So this hints that there is a strong connection between a jetted phase of an AGN and supermassive black hole growth. And for this kind of, um, to confirm these kind of studies, of course, we need better um, evolution studies of the source classes. And also they strongly depend on number of sources found per redshift bin. And this is where blazers become extremely important because for every blazer do de you detect, you actually have, uh, you can infer, if you want, the population of sources which have these powerful jets, but they're not pointed at you because the blazer configuration is very, um, you're very lucky when you find a blazer source pointed at you, but you can infer the population of similar sources with similar jets pointed away from our line of sight that are just too dim for us to detect. And this correction is called the two gamma square correction where gamma is the bulk Lorentz factor of the jet. So how fast are your electrons moving along these jets? So if you can find your sources and you know they are gamma, which usually ranges between 10 to 15, then you can infer how many more sources are there. So if we have a gamma of 10, we have 200 more sources per, per blazer found. If gamma is 15, then we have 400 to 500 more sources. And as you can see here, I was highlighting that there, we are talking about a peak at redshift four, but maybe there are two peaks of this population if you look at uh, gamma ray detected blazers. And we will talk about this point a bit later on in few slides. So let's think about this. 
Another question that these sources can help us answer is the composition of the cosmic high energy background. Shown here in its intensity as function of energy, this is the cumulative emission of both resolved and unresolved point sources that emit from soft X-rays all the way up to gamma rays. And blazers have been found to contribute different percentages at different parts of this plot. If we zoom in into the gamma ray part detected by the Fermi LAT, here are the data points detected by the instrument, uh, we see that blazer contribution is this gray shaded area. So blazers contribute more or less 30% uh, below 100 GV, but as we increase in energy, they contribute more and more up to maybe 100% at the very higher energies. A different story if you look at the soft X-rays, because in soft X-rays, we actually know that the cosmic X-ray background is mostly produced by AGNs, which do not have jets, but emit in X-rays. However, if we zoom in into the hard X-ray part, so above 14 keV, we see that blazers start to account for about 5 to 10% of the CXV. And these blazers, which are our MEV blazers, could actually contribute up to 100% of the MEV background, which is the middle part of this plot, which has not been explored since the early 2000s. So these sources are really, really interesting, and we need to find more of them and study how do, we, do they evolve to answer many of these questions. So what did I do in all of this? Well, what I was interested in is actually try to understand how did these MEV blazers evolve. And to do this, what you need to construct is a so-called luminosity function, which is basically telling you the number of sources you find per luminosity beam and commoving volume. So to do this, I uh, took advantage of the old sky survey um, at the, of the BAD instrument on board of SWIFT, which covers from 14 to one, uh, 195 keV, and um, has released recently their 105-month um, catalog, which is the latest catalog. Shown here, it's basically all the sources detected in the catalog uh, grayed out on the background, and the red stars, you can imagine, are our blazers. And you see by eye that blazers do not are not the major population of the sources detected by the bat. They actually just make up for about 10% of the total sources. However, these are enough to study their evolution as we have um, several redshift for many of them, up to redshift 4.6, uh, the highest redshift one. So again, what are the ingredients to construct this luminosity function? We're talking luminosity, so we need redshift and we need flux. And of course, we need blazers. So we take the bat 105 catalog, month catalog, we clear, um, um, we cross match it with several blazer catalog, and then we just define our clean sample of blazers, and then just take the ones that have flux and redshift. Then we need to also perform some set of cuts to minimize the uncertainties. For example, we don't want contamination from um, galactic sources, so we, we cut at uh, 10 degrees in latitude so that we exclude the galactic plane, and we do several cuts in flux and significance of detection to have. Uh, high significant sources. Then we need to take into account the fact that every survey has its bias. And in the case for the BAT survey, this is due by the, let's say, not really even exposure of the whole sky. And you can see here, this is the exposure map of the survey, um, where the bright spots are the ones that have been observed for more time by the instrument, while the gray out areas are the ones that have been exposed for lesser time. So of course, if you observe for less time, you go um, less deep in uh, sensitivity. And so you have some biases that you have to take into account because you will detect lesser sources at a certain flux with a certain sensitivity just due to your exposure. All this information is encompassed by uh, into this function called the sky coverage of the instrument, which is shown here as function of flux. Uh, so you see that at high fluxes, we see uh, sources everywhere in the sky above five sigma threshold. Uh, selected for our analysis. But as we go to lower and lower fluxes, this sky coverage decreases quite significantly. So at the limiting flux, actually for every source we detect for this flux, we are missing out 100 to 1,000 more sources that we just don't see because the instrument has not exposed long enough certain region in the sky. So once you, know your, when you have your sample and you know your biases, then the last thing you need is your X-ray luminosity function model, which we take from other work and are the same ones that I've ex uh, explained to you at the very beginning of this talk. You put this all together and you get a luminosity function that looks like this. So on the left, you see the luminosity function as function of redshift. And on the right, you see luminosity function as function of luminosity. 
And there are a few takeaway points that I wanted to take from these plots. First of all, we confirm that this source evolved positively in redshift. So as we go earlier on in time, there are either more or more luminous blazers. If we look at the plot on the right, what we could uh, derive is the fact that their peak in evolution is actually uh, around Rachi 4.3. So it's, uh, we confirm with our statistics that it's above Rachi 4. Previous work had already said this, but we now finally have one source above Rachi 4 that if we could have brought down this distribution, it could have uh, highlighted a peak earlier, later on in the history of time, but actually no, we already confirmed that the peak is beyond Rachi 4. And unfortunately, we cannot say yet whether this is a luminosity or a density evolution, because as, as I let it here, if you look at the luminosity function as function of luminosity, the, no matter the redshift bin you look at, it's just a power law. So we're really sampling a power law luminosity function. And we cannot, uh, in these two scenarios, be um, luminosity evolution or density evolution, um, they, the result is the same. So we cannot tell them apart. What we will really hope for is a sort of break appearing um, at the lowest luminosity part of things to tell us that actually um, how this peak evolves can tell us whether it's a density evolution or a luminosity evolution. And you may see that here we start to see a hint of a break in our model. However, within the statistical uncertainties of our data points, we cannot really say that this is a significant break and therefore we cannot distinguish the two models. Once we have these um, uh, luminosity functions, we can then derive the contribution to the backgrounds. And if we look at the contribution in the X-ray backgrounds, again, we have that our blazers make up for about two up to 10% of the CXP. But the same one can actually make up, if you extrapolate it to the MEV band, those are the same ones that can make up to 70 to 100% of the total MEV background. Here, the two uh, areas that you see, the um, uh, the Magenta one is the uh, luminosity evolution model. The blue one is uh, the um, density evolution model. And so again, if you extrapolate it to the MEV band, we see that the luminosity function model, including its uncertainty, actually quite, can explain quite well the MEV background. However, the density evolution model overpredicts slightly the background, hinting that maybe a luminosity function model is preferred. But again, this is the uncertainty is quite large, so we cannot really make strong conclusion in this case. But we do know that there are other source classes that do contribute to the MEV background. So the PLE model will allow us a bit of freedom to enter more source classes into this area of the plot. Another finding from uh, this distribution is that we could derive properties of the whole uh, sample as well as, as the parents of these jetted sources. In case of blazers, what we found is that their distribution of viewing angle are um, average around three degrees. So we really are looking down the barrel of the jet and only for very few sources, we, we get up to 10 degrees, but otherwise after that, we cannot see them anymore because we, we suffer strong selection effects. But if we look at the gamma, uh, at the gamma distribution, we see that actually our gamma factor on average is about uh, around eight. And this is quite important because remember the two gamma square correction, if we use gamma of 15, which most other have used so far, then we predict 400 more sources per blazer detected. But if our gamma is lower, then again, we have fewer sources um, at different redshifts. And this also, uh, you can think of it if we look at the number densities, because th those are two separate things. But what we find here, if we look at the number density of blazers as function of redshift in different luminosity beams, and we compare it with the uh, most luminous sources found by the work in Ayala in 2009, our work predicts, uh, finds that there are, sorry, uh, less uh, sources at earlier, uh, earlier on. So the number densities are lower. So if we combine all of this, lower number densities and lower gamma factors, then maybe this hints to the fact that this peak could shift downwards. We haven't redone this work yet, but this is a hint that maybe the um, there are some um, selection effect within to this peak and maybe it's not as dominant as shown here. Uh, another um, things that we try to compare is whether gamma ray detected blazers and hard X-ray detected blazers are one of the same or two different population of sources. And what we find is that if we take their average SEDs, 
Um, their parameters quite, they are quite the same. However, gamma ray detected blazers, which are the blue ones, versus the red ones, which are the hard X-ray detected ones, which we study, we see that their SEDs are lo lower luminosities and peak a bit higher, uh, at higher energies with respect to the hard X-ray blazers. And previous work has shown that the evolution of gamma ray blazers actually shows a quite nice peak at redshift two, which reminds us of the peak um, in the space density function, right? So, and uh, a work that I did in 2020 also predicted that their um, density evolution model is preferred over a luminosity evolution model. So different peaks, possibly different evolution if our luminosity is preferred for hard X-ray blazers. What we hypothesize is not that these sources are different sources in, is in intrinsically different blazers, but possibly that these blazers are following kind of the AGN downsizing uh, scenario where most luminous and most powerful sources powered by most massive black holes are found earlier on. And then as we go on in time, we see uh, less, less powerful sources with uh, black hole masses that are lower. But again, we need to redo the gamma, fun the gamma ray luminosity function to pinpoint these claims. Uh, and finally, a very interesting thing that we could derive from this work where uh, maybe we could make prediction for uh, how many blazers would be detected by forthcoming MED missions. So we took our luminosity function and we could extrapolate um, the source count distribution of blazers in different MED bands. So this is just number of sources per flux um, and, and different um, MED bands. And then if you take your favorite MED mission, with its sensitivity in its own band, then you can derive how many total sources would be seen in a number of years of surveys. And we see that, the, for example, the Fermi LAT has quite a lot of potential in this low energy band, which is quite unexplored because it's very problematic, could see up to a thousand sources. And then COSY, which will launch in 2027, will have about 40 to 60 sources. And then missions that will one day be reproposed to NASA and ASA will maybe see up to 100 to 1,000 of more MEV blazers. So MEV uh, blazers, uh, the future is bright at MEV band, but we need a very good instrument or maybe use something that we already have. And finally, uh, with this MEV prediction, we could actually say, okay, but if one of these missions would fly for say two years, how many of the sources that a mission like COSI would detect would be found in coincidence with neutrino detection by IceCube? And what we see is that COSI, for example, could see up to two coincident neutrinos from blazer sources and forthcoming MEV mission could see up to 10 uh, neutrinos. So uh, quite an interesting uh, result. Uh, so this brings me to my summary, and I hope I am on time. Just take a message. MEV blazers are really, really interesting sources to study and to uh, follow their evolution. They evolve positively, more or more luminous sources earlier on. The peak at redshift 4.3. However, we just don't, cannot still discern whether a luminosity density function is um, preferred. Contribution to the CXB is less than 10%, but can make up to 100% of the MEV background. We have jet distribution with uh, jet gamma fa factors that are lower than previously uh, used, let's say, for uh, the most luminous blazers. And MEV mission will detect up to 100 to 1,000 more blazers, possibly coincident with some neutrinos. And if you're interested to know what's coming next, I will leave you up with this slide where uh, we are already building an MEV catalog making use of the Fermi data because that's what we see that there is a lot of potential in that band. We have new high redshift blazer beyond redshift four uh, that are coming in, uh, in through a NOSA proposal that got accepted last year that will enable us to study the gamma factor of these sources. And then we are the, uh, starting also the gamma ray luminosity function study to compare these two source classes. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, and if we have time, you ask me any question or contact me by email. Thank you very much, Laia. I think we have uh, uh, one or two quick questions uh, and time. Uh, so then I saw your hands uh, raised. Could you uh, ask a question, open your mic? Yeah, yeah. So, uh the talk where are the the non-aligned sources and what i'm i'm thinking is even with a uh, lorentz factor of eight, eight 
non-aligned sign source will be invisible. Visible. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, uh, so these these uh, here, this plot was. Uh, this is really telling us about the blazers. So these values are for the blazer sources. So the jetted ones. Uh, and so these ones are really found with very narrow viewing angle, and those are the gamma factors uh, from this, from the population of these blazers. Now, this distribution come from um, deriving the properties of the parent population. So I may have a few slides here that could illustrate this. It's, it's more explained in the paper, but what we did is the following. So we have the beam luminosity function, right? So we know how the beam sources look like in luminosity function space. And work from Uri and Schaefer showed that you can actually, well, what they, they show is, is the, the inverse. So they started with a luminosity function of the parents distributed as a power law function. And what they found is that if you only take into account beaming, the luminosity function of the beam sources would be a power law with a broken power law, which is at its high end as the same shape as the parent population. And then all the low luminosity sources will be concentrated in this area where you have a shallower uh, index of the broken power law. Now, what we have is the beam function, right? So what we were able to do is take our beam luminosity function and try to reconstruct our uh, parent population luminosity function. Again, uh, you may notice that I've said it before, but what we have, we're dealing with is just a power law of the high luminosity end of this distribution. We do not see the break appearing here. So it's a bit complicated to make this in inference. But what we take into account here is um, the there is a certain distribution of jets just randomly distributed in the sky and the gamma factors follow a, a distribution, um, a power law distribution. So with this in, in hand and this several integral fit to a power law, we could derive these properties of um, gamma factors and uh, viewing angles, which uh, as you say, it's for the beam sources, basically what I show, because we just saw, we, we just derived the property of um, the beam population and what we could compare for the unbeam sources is mostly number densities. Um, telling us that most likely FR2 kind of sources are the parents for these bright blazers, which are mostly FSRQ kind of sources. Um, but for the viewing angle, it's mostly related to the blazer ones that we study. Okay, uh, yeah, please. Hi, Leah, Tom Stoner here. Um, is this on or is it that on for the mic? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you say that the peak in the blazer luminosity function is at redshift of 4.5, mm. uh, doing chi by i on your figures, it looks like a linear fit might do just as well. So what are the confidence intervals on the 4.5? Um, uh, that's a, Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so here it's, it, it's kind of a, a bit misleading in the sense is how it's plotted. You don't really see a peak appearing. I would have to uh, extend, this is because I was kind of, just ribbing in the data and then in this up to here you just see a sort of line that doesn't turn over which i think that's what kind of your question hints um if i were to plot this to a higher and higher redshift then you would see a bit of a turnover which is not super significant and of course we only have one source at higher redshift so what we tried there is so basically, um, we did the luminosity function without constraining the peak position, and the best fit turns out to be 4.3. Then what we did is we took uh, the best fit luminosity function and we froze the peak of the evolution at different redshift between redshift 3.5 and up to 5. We just tested it. We just tested to see um, whether the, the likelihood fit would give us um, a good value. And so basically then we uh, show, it, it, it's there is a figure in the paper, which I don't have here in the extra slide, but it shows that the best fit goes uh, at Reggie 4.3. So you basically have the maximum likelihood being uh, minimum at Reggie 4.3, which indicates that again, it's the um, location of the peak. The uncertainty itself on the peak, we could place them only to be plus or minus uh, one. So okay. it's not super constrained. Uh, however, these tests have shown that it's really 
has to be uh, above RG4. Thanks. Uh, sorry, we, I think we have another workshop want to use this room. So uh, I thank Laia and uh, uh, Paul again, and uh, see you next week. Uh, please feel free to reach out to Laia uh, if you have any further questions. Thank, Thank you, you. Laya.